guys, it's Kaylee, and welcome back to Hippie in a Suit, where I talk about sustainability because I dream of a world where we recognize that unlimited growth forever and ever and ever is simply not possible. Hey, it's me. Sorry I've been away for a while, but we are now back to regularly scheduled programming with another deep dive in my SDG series. For those of you who are new to the channel, these videos go into a lot of detail on each of the 17 sustainable development goals, which means they are quite lengthy. However, at the end of the video, I do summarize the goal in like two minutes. So if you just want the super high level overview, you can jump to that section by checking out the chapters in the description box below. And if you haven't already watched my primer on the SDGs as an overall agenda, I do recommend checking that out first so you understand the framework that each of these goals is a part of. Today, we are zooming in on SDG 8, which looks at economic growth and decent work. Now, I have to admit, I do have a bit of a complex relationship with this goal. Not only is it extremely long, which has made it an absolute monster to research and write and record and seriously I can't even tell you how painful it was getting through this one but on a more substantive level I also find the inclusion of economic growth in the 2030 agenda counter to the fundamental premise of sustainability which of course is a state of balance and stasis and not one of unlimited growth. However, I do think you will find that when we dive into this goal, the way that economic growth is explained is very nuanced. It's not a carte blanche to consume as much as possible in the name of GDP. It's really about rethinking how we give economic opportunities to individuals without exploiting them and without exploiting our planet. As always, my blog post is linked below and it has links to all the research used in this video, resources where you can learn more, and a few organizations who work on this topic that you may choose to follow or support if you are interested in this work. Okay, without further ado, let's dive into SDG 8, Economic Growth and Decent Work. SDG 8 is made up of 10 targets and two means of implementation. As the title demonstrates, the goal covers two broad domains, economic growth and decent work. But there are also a few surprises in this goal. The first four targets are about economic growth and productivity, and then the next four targets are a focus on employment and labor rights, including ending modern slavery and providing safe working conditions. But the last two targets are kind of wild cards, and they cover sustainable tourism as well as access to financial services. Since there is so much in this goal, I think we better just dive into the targets so you can see what I mean. Target 8.1, sustain per capita economic growth in accordance with the national circumstances and in particular at least 7% gross domestic product growth per annum in least developed countries. As you can see, this target is focused on growth, which, as I said previously, does cause me a little bit of discomfort. Our society's fixation on growth is the root cause of many or possibly all of the social and environmental problems we currently face. Having said that, we also know that economic growth is crucial to lifting people out of poverty, so I want to focus on the creative wording of this target. Saying economic growth in accordance with national circumstances applies that the same level of growth is not appropriate for every country. This is very consistent with my experience working at the UN on green growth. Effectively, growth is necessary for some countries, particularly those who are poor but degrowth may be necessary for others. I'm not gonna get into degrowth in this video, but I will make a full one on it at some point. Now let's break down how this target is measured. Target 8.1 has only one indicator, and that is annual growth rate of real GDP per capita. Real GDP per capita measures the annual level of national income per person adjusted for inflation. It gives a rough indication of average living standards. So how do we gauge what is solid economic growth? Well, we can see that in the target, the agenda calls for 7% growth in least developed countries, but is generally accepted that for developed countries, 
an annual GDP growth rate of 2 to 3% is considered normal. The world economy as a whole experienced a high annual GDP per capita growth rate of around 4% in the four years immediately before COVID-19. And the decade before that, the rate was hovering just over 2%. The pandemic has caused extreme fluctuations in GDP. 2020 was the largest fall in global GDP since the Great Depression, an almost immediate drop of 5.9%. However, economic growth rebounded greatly in 2021 as the world recovered and is currently sitting around 5.8% annual growth, according to the World Bank. Even before the pandemic, the 7% GDP growth target for least developed countries had not been reached. In fact, the actual GDP growth rate per capita was hovering around the global average at 2% in 2018 and fell to 1.5% in 2019. As with all countries, COVID caused plummeting of GDP growth rates in least developed countries or LDCs as we call them, and they have now reached a growth rate of 4.2% less than the global average. According to UNCTAD, only one of the 46 LDCs is predicted to meet the 7% growth rate in 2022. Target 8.2, achieve higher levels of economic productivity through diversification, technological upgrading and innovation, including through a focus on high value added and labor intensive sectors. In order to understand this target, one must understand labor productivity. Labor productivity measures hourly output of a country's economy. Specifically, it charts the amount of GDP produced by an hour of labor. This concept can be a little confusing, but generally the idea is that one hour worked can produce many different outputs. For example, one hour of work constructing a computer will produce more economic value than one hour producing a clay pot. And if you have technology like, say, machines that can produce 100 computers in an hour, you will produce significantly more economic value value. Knowing this, growth in labor productivity is dependent on three main factors, physical labor, human capital, and technology. Physical capital are the inputs necessary to create outputs. Human capital is the level of knowledge, skills, and expertise that workers have, and technology is a tool that allows more work to be done with less inputs. Just think about computer processing as an example here. Doing complex mathematical models would take hundreds of hours of time manually, but they can be done in seconds with a computer. I hope these examples make it apparent why labor productivity growth is essential for low-income countries. We all have the same number of hours in the day, so if we spend them producing things with lower economic value, it stands to reason that it's harder to make the income needed to provide for our basic needs and necessities. It's hard to give general trends about where we stand on labor productivity because it's so specific to each country. So let me just highlight a few interesting points. First, the most productive country on the planet is Luxembourg, with $107.40 of GDP per hour worked, which makes sense. It's a small population, it's a knowledge economy, mostly focused on finance. However, the actual indicator for this goal is not about the level of labor productivity. It's about the productivity growth rate over time. The global average productivity growth rate reached 1.6% in 2018 and 1.4% 1 in 2019. The top growing country on this indicator is Libya, with over 115% growth. And Bolivia and Myanmar are experiencing the lowest growth at negative 12% and negative 15% respectively. But as I mentioned, it is very country specific. The only general trend I can point to is that since 2000, growth in labor productivity has been higher in lower and upper middle income countries than it has been in low and high income countries, so higher in the middle there. Target 8.3, promote development-oriented policies that support productive activities, decent job creation, entrepreneurship, creativity, and innovation, and encourage the formalization and growth of micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises, including through access to financial services. 
While there is a lot wrapped up in this target, it all boils down to reducing informal employment. The informal sector is an invisible sector that is not regulated by the government. It includes all jobs in unregistered and or small-scale private unincorporated enterprises that produce goods or services meant for sale or barter. This could be, for example, self-employed street vendors, taxi drivers, or home-based workers. According to the ILO, workers who are informally employed frequently lack access to social protection, income security, and basic rights at work, and this undermines job transitions and entrepreneurship. A low informality rate in a country is a reflection of effective and inclusive institutions that benefit the whole of society and which are essential to promoting innovation and creativity. This target is measured by the proportion of informal employment in non-agricultural employment by sex. So where do we stand on this one? While progress in reducing informality is generally poor, and informal employment continues to be a reality for around 61% of workers worldwide. This means that 2 billion people worldwide worked in jobs that lack basic protection. The share is much higher in LDCs where the proportion of informal employment was 88.7% in 2019. Globally, the share of informal employment was 90.7% in the agriculture sector compared to 48.9% in the non-agricultural sector. There's a gender dimension here as well. In developing countries, 75% of women are in the informal economy, where they are less likely to have employment contracts, legal rights, or social protection, and are often not paid enough to escape poverty. 600 million women in developing countries are in the most insecure and precarious forms of work. Target 8.4, improve progressively through 2030 global resource efficiency in consumption and production, and endeavor to decouple economic growth from environmental degradation in accordance with the 10-year framework of programs on sustainable consumption and production with developed countries taking the lead. All right, now we're talking. This is the nuance around economic growth that I was referring to at the top of the video. Let's dig into decoupling. Decoupling happens when there is a negative correlation between GDP growth and material footprint. This means that when growth is experienced, material footprint should decrease or at least remain the same. This has never happened at a global level, but has been seen to a degree in about 32 countries who were able to decouple their growth from carbon emissions. Now, I want to make sure it's clear that this decoupling is only from emissions, not all material footprint, but it's still encouraging. In all my research, I could not find an example of full material decoupling. Some critics believe that decoupling is a delusion that allows for propagation of the use of GDP as an inappropriate measure for well-being, and I totally see that argument, to be honest. But for me, it's better than just unchecked growth, which is basically what we have right now. This target is measured by two indicators. The first is material footprint, material footprint per capita, and material footprint per unit of GDP. Material footprint is defined as the total amount of raw material required for production of a product or a service. In other words, it's the total amount of natural resources demanded to sustain activities of our economic and social systems. The second indicator is domestic material consumption, domestic material consumption per capita, and domestic material consumption per unit of GDP. You get the idea. Which it's very similar to the first indicator, but it's focused on materials used in the national economy either imported or export. Recent indicators show an alarming upward trend in consumption per capita at the global level, which is no surprise. But if we look at it per unit of GDP, instead, a flattening can be observed from 2011 onwards, but of course, the actual consumption is not decreasing. The rising trend of consumption per capita is driven mainly by strong increases in demand in Asia, Latin America and the Caribbean, and other developing and emerging markets. But of course we know that developed countries are the biggest culprits of overconsumption. An average person living in a high income country maintains a material footprint consumption of 60% more than those living in upper and middle income countries. 
and over 13 times the level of those living in low-income countries. Target 8.5. By 2030, achieve full and productive employment and decent work for all women and men, including for young people and persons with disabilities, and equal pay for work of equal value. I think this one is pretty straightforward, but to fully understand this target, we simply need to look at the words full and productive. Full means having employment or not being unemployed, and productive means equal pay for work of equal value. The indicators for this target correspond to these concepts. The first indicator looks at wage gaps by measuring average hourly earnings of female and male employees by occupation, sex, and for persons with disabilities. The second indicator measures the unemployment rate by age, sex, and disability status. Women globally are paid on average 19 to 22% less than men. The largest gender pay gaps are usually found at the top and the bottom of the wage distribution. You may have heard these referred to as the glass ceiling for highly skilled women workers or the sticky floor for women working in the lowest paid jobs. It's important to remember that we cannot treat women as one homogenous group. For example, there is a gap between mothers and non-mothers as well, and this is known as the motherhood pay gap, and it ranges from 1 to 30%. While the gender pay gap is slowly narrowing, at the current rate of progress, it will take more than 70 years to close it completely. The disability pay gap in the period of 1997 to 2014 was 13% for men and 7% for women. Unemployment rates are higher for women than for men in most countries. Also, young people aged 15 to 24 experience a higher unemployment rate than the rest of the working age population. In 2020, and thanks to COVID, the global unemployment rate reached 6.5%, up 1.1 percentage points from the previous year. The number of people unemployed worldwide increased by 33 million, reaching 220 million, and another 81 million people left the labor market altogether. Youth and women were especially hard hit with unemployment losses of 8.7% and 5% respectively in 2020, compared with 3.7% for adults and 3.9% for men. Not to mention that before the pandemic, the youth unemployment rate was already three times that of adults. Disabled people also have a disproportionate unemployment rate. The overall employment rate for disabled people was about 35% in 2014, where it was around 63% for men and 57% for women among non-disabled people. Target 8.6, by 2020, substantially reduced the proportion of youth not in employment, education, or training. This target largely builds on the last one, focusing specifically on youth employment activities and opportunities. The acronym given to this concept is NEAT, not in employment, education, or training. And being in this state means that young people are not gaining the skills needed for the labor market, which reduces their future chances of finding employment. In the long run, this both increases social exclusion of young people and undermines the ability of an economy to grow over a sustained period. Even though this goal had a 2020 target, it's pretty clear we didn't reach that. At the global level, the youth NEAT rate decreased by a mere two percentage points between 2005 and 2018. In 2018, more than one in five or 21% of young people worldwide were NEAT. The pandemic also led to an increase in youth NEAT. In 2019, this figure was just 22.3%. Quarterly figures indicate that the NEAT rate worsened from the fourth quarter of 2019 to the second quarter of 2020 in 42 out of 49 countries with available data, which is not surprising because youth workers were more severely affected than older workers by employment losses in 2020. In addition, both technical and vocational education and on-the-job training suffered massive disruptions, forcing many to quit their studies. There's also a gender dimension to need. Worldwide, young women are twice as likely as young men to be jobless and not engaged in education or training. In 2019, the global meat rate was 31.1% for young women, compared with 14% for young men. 
The gender gap is especially wide in lower and middle income countries where young women are more than three times as likely as young men to have NEAT status. Okay, trigger warning for the next target. It's focused on modern slavery, human trafficking, and child labor. So if that's too much for you, just use the chapters below to go to target 8.8. .8. Target 8.7, take immediate and effective measures to eradicate forced labor and modern slavery and human trafficking and secure the prohibition and elimination of the worst forms of child labor, including recruitment and use of child soldiers, and by 2025, end child labor in all its forms. There's a lot wrapped up in this particular target, but ultimately it's measured only by looking at instances of child labor. However, for the purposes of this video, I do wanna give quick definitions on each of the concepts within this target. The concepts of forced labor, modern slavery, and human trafficking are closely linked, but they do have slight differences. According to the ILO, forced labor is work that is performed involuntarily and under the menace of a penalty. It refers to situations in which people are coerced to work through the use of violence or intimidation or by subtle means such as manipulated debt, retention of identity papers, or threats of denunciation of immigration authorities. Modern slavery is the severe exploitation of other people for personal or commercial gain and is generally considered to be made up of both forced labor and forced marriage. Human trafficking is the use of violence, threats, or coercion to transport, recruit, or harbor people in order to exploit them for purposes such as forced prostitution, labor, criminality, marriage, or organ removal. Child labor is work that deprives children from their childhood, their potential, and their dignity, and that is harmful to physical and mental development. Specifically, it is work that is mentally, physically, socially, or morally dangerous and harmful to children and or interferes with their schooling. So this is not an after-school job to make some extra pocket money. It's specifically exploitative work. Global data demonstrates that most child labor takes place in family settings such as family farms or in family enterprises. Child labor outside of family settings is in fact the exception rather than the rule. According to the latest ILO Global Estimates, about 152 million children worldwide, 64 million girls and 88 million boys are child laborers accounting for almost 10% of the child population. 73 million of these children work in hazardous conditions. Great strides have been made in reducing child labor worldwide. The overall number of child laborers decreased by approximately 94 million between 2000 and 2016. However, progress has slowed down in recent years. In addition, progress is by no means uniform and regional discrepancies abound in child labor decline rates. In fact, Sub-Saharan Africa experienced a 1% increase in child labor prevalence rates between 2012 and 2016. And while it's not part of the official indicator, I did want to include some statistics on modern slavery as well. 49.6 million people were living in modern slavery in 2021, of which 27.6 million were in forced labor and 22 million were in forced marriage. Target 8.8, .8, protect labor rights and promote safe and secure working environments for all workers, including migrant workers, in particular women migrants and those in precarious employment. This target looks at labor rights, specifically the right to collective bargaining and workplace safety. It is measured by two indicators. The first is fatal and non-fatal occupational injuries per 100,000 workers by sex and migration status. And the second is the level of national compliance with labor rights, which is freedom of association and collective bargaining based on ILO textual sources and national legislation by sex and migration status. Oh, that's a big mouthful, but basically we're looking at how well these countries are abiding by ILO texts and conventions. 
Freedom of Association and Collective Bargaining, or FACB, are rights that are considered enabling rights, meaning that protecting and upholding them is necessary to promoting and realizing other rights at work. For the first indicator, there are serious gaps in data coverage, so most of the data we have was for the EU only. Overall, the median rate of fatal occupational industries was 5.7 per 100,000 workers based on available data for 77 countries since 2010. Desegregation by sex shows that there's a greater risk for men than for women, which reflects men's greater likelihood of working in hazardous industries. For the second indicator, there are also gaps, but we do have data on how many countries have ratified important ILO texts. Since the adoption of the Freedom of Association and Protection of the Right to Organize Convention in 1948 and the Right to Organize and Collective Bargaining Convention in 1949, a growing number of ILO member states have ratified these two instruments. At the time of this recording, the two conventions had secured 155 and 166 ratifications, respectively. Target 8.9. By 2030, devise and implement policies to promote sustainable tourism that creates jobs and promotes local culture and products. Tourism is an important economic engine and employing industry in many countries, including countries with few other industries or natural resources. Tourism employs one in 10 people worldwide. And pre-pandemic, tourism worldwide was on the increase, particularly in developing and transitioning economies. The pandemic caused a massive drop in tourism, which was a 74% decline and an estimated loss of $1.3 trillion. This affected all regions with over 100 million livelihoods and millions of businesses put at risk. The impact was especially pronounced in small island developing states, or SIDS as we call them, since they are more reliant than other countries on tourism as a source of income and employment. This target is measured by one indicator, and that is tourism direct GDP as a proportion of total GDP and its growth rate. In the decade before the pandemic, the GDP generated by international tourism increased at a higher rate than the rest of the economy, representing 4.1% of global GDP in 2019. Over the last 20 years, the number of arrivals in international tourism doubled, arrivals in developing economies increased on average by 5.5%, and in transition economies by 6.9% each year as compared to 2.6% in developed economies. Target 8.10, strengthen the capacity of domestic financial institutions to encourage and expand access to banking, insurance, and financial services for all. Target 8.10 calls for all citizens to have improved access to banking, insurance, and financial services, which can be achieved by strengthening the capacity of domestic financial institutions. 1.7 billion people worldwide are unbanked, and 980 million of those people are women. Investment in digital infrastructure can help rural workers, especially women who face additional constraints, to enjoy the benefits of mobile banking and to obtain much-needed credit and insurance. This target is measured by the number of commercial bank branches and automatic teller machines, ATMs, per 100,000 adults, and the proportion of adults aged 15 and older with an account at a bank or a financial institution or with a mobile money service provider. Despite the huge challenge, there is positive news on this target. Access to finance is on the rise globally, but the mode of access is changing thanks to technology. From 2010 to 2017, the number of automated teller machines, ATMs, per 100,000 adults grew by close to 50%, from 45 to 66 globally, and from 2.3 to 5.8 in least developed countries. The number of commercial bank branches per 100,000 adults grew by only 2% between 2010 and 2017, with more customers using digital banking solutions. Oh my gosh, folks, we're almost there. This goal is so long, but we're getting there. Let's now move into the means of implementation and then we can wrap it up with our summary. This goal has two means of implementation targets, one focused on increasing aid for trade, 
which if you're not familiar, is an initiative that seeks to mobilize resources to address the obstacles related to supply side capacity and trade infrastructure that constrain the ability of developing countries and LDCs to engage in international trade. And another one that calls for specific youth employment strategies. So I'll quickly read those to you. Target 8A, Increase aid for trade support for developing countries, in particularly least developed countries, including through the enhanced integrated framework for trade related technical assistance to least developed countries. 8b, by 2020, develop and operationalize a global strategy for youth employment and implement the Global Jobs Pact of the International Labor Organization. We did it! <laughs> Seriously, this goal is so long and I've had so many technical issues while I've been trying to film this, so I hope it comes out okay. But let's summarize and then let's close this one out. SDG 8 covers decent work and economic growth. It is made up of 10 targets and two means of implementation. Target 8.1 encourages nationally appropriate GDP growth. Specifically, it calls for high growth of at least 7% in least developed countries to lift people out of poverty. The world is experiencing great degrees of growth volatility, so it's difficult to look at long-term trends, but currently only one of 46 LDCs is predicted to meet the 7% rate in 2022. Target 8.2 calls for high levels of labor productivity. Labor productivity measures the hourly output of a country's economy and is dependent on three main factors, physical capital, human capital, and technology. It is a very country-specific measure, so it's hard to give general trends, but global average labor productivity growth in 2019 was around 1.4%. Target 8.3 aims to reduce informal employment. Workers who are informally employed frequently lack access to social protection, income security, and basic rights at work. Progress in reducing informality is poor, and 61% of workers, or roughly 2 billion people, work in jobs that lack basic protection. Target 8.4 looks at resource efficiency and decoupling. Decoupling happens when there is a negative correlation between GDP growth and material footprint. We have seen some countries decouple economic growth from CO2 emissions, but overconsumption remains a massive problem. Currently, a person living in a high-income country maintains a material footprint of 60% more than people living in upper-middle-income countries and of 13 times more than the level of low-income countries. Target 8.5 calls for full and productive employment for all, particularly youth, women, and people with disabilities. This target includes closing wage gaps. Women globally make 19-22% to less than men, and the disability pay gap is approximately 13% for men and 7% for women. Young people aged 15 to 24 experience a higher unemployment rate than the rest of the working age population. Target 8.6 aims to reduce youth not in employment, education, or training, or NEAT for short. More than 1 in 5 or 21% of young people worldwide are NEAT. Target 8.7 demands eradication of forced labor, modern slavery, and human trafficking. Currently, 152 million children worldwide are child laborers and 49.6 million people were living in modern slavery. Target 8.8 .8 protects labor rights and promotes safe and secure working environments according to ILO conventions on freedom of association and collective bargaining. Target 8.9 relates to sustainable tourism, which is an important economic driver in many countries, particularly small island developing states. And Target 8.10 calls for access to financial services. Although 1.7 billion people are unbanked, technology and mobile banking innovation are leading to greater improvements on this target. This goal also has two means of implementation targets, one focused on increasing aid for trade and another that calls for specific youth employment strategies. And that's SDG 8. And that's it. That's all I have for you. Thank you for sticking with me. I know it was an absolute doozy and shout out to Kenza, my researcher who had to compile like 25 pages of research to get this thing done. If you learned something in this video, give it a like. I'll be back very soon with SDG 9 on industry, innovation, and infrastructure. And I have some really cool content coming for you all this fall. So I hope that you will stick with me. As always, thank you so much for being here. Don't forget to check out the blog post if you want more information or to continue learning about this topic. See you in the next one. And until then, keep fighting the good fight. Bye.